As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. May God add his blessing to his word. Please be seated. Has there ever been an event that you have seen, witnessed, but you realize that someone else interpreted it entirely differently than you did? I, I remember hearing the story of four people sitting across from each other in a little stall on a train. A beautiful blonde, a, a nun, an Ohio State fan, and a Michigan fan, all in this little little stall in the train, and they're headed to the NCAA March Madness in Indianapolis. And here they are sitting in the stall. The train goes into the tunnel, and there's total darkness for a brief moment, during which time you can hear the distinct sound of a, of a loud slap. Well, as the train is leaving the tunnel, sunlight fills the void, lights the scene, and the confused Michigan fan is holding his burning red cheek and, and, and kind of looking around quizzically. Now, the nun, she is thinking to herself, that Michigan fan probably tried to kiss the blonde, and she slapped him. Good for her. Well, the blonde is thinking, that Michigan fan probably tried to kiss me, but the, he accidentally kissed the nun instead, and she slapped him. The Michigan fan is thinking, I bet that Ohio State fan tried to kiss the blonde, and she smacked me mistakenly. The Ohio State fan is thinking, next tunnel, I'm going to slap that Michigan fan even harder. Did that, that went so much better in the first service. What was wrong with you people? Come on, help me out here. Boy, Ohio State didn't do very well, did they, at, uh, in Indianapolis? And so they got some making up to do, that's for sure. Well, this morning, we're going to go to a place called Gagatha. And this event in history, the truth is, it's been interpreted in more divergent ways, maybe more than any other event. 
Now, I, I, I want you to know there are some people who debate whether Jesus died at all. In Islam, for instance, many will suggest that, that God protected Jesus and put someone who looked like Jesus on the cross. That's what many in Islam believe. But most people believe that Jesus died. It is why he died that causes the debate. Gandhi, for instance, wrote in his autobiography, I can accept Jesus as a martyr. His death on the cross was certainly a good example, but that there was anything else to his suffering, like the idea of dying for, uh, as a substitute for sinners, this my heart can never accept. Bart Ehrman, who is a liberal New Testament professor at Princeton, was once asked, what would make you a believer? And he said, well, if Jesus had fulfilled the promise to bring peace on earth, that would have done it. Instead, he died, which represented the total failure of his mission. Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist, calls the Christian understanding of the cross divine child abuse. Now, of course, most people that you and I know are not nearly as hostile as that toward the cross. But I've got to admit that there are a number of people who will say things like, you know, I get the idea that we need God and that we ought to believe in God. I, I see evidence of that, but I don't quite figure out, I can't quite understand what the big deal is about Jesus. And most certainly, what it is about the cross. Now, I find that fascinating because the cross is an identifier. We see it all around us. There are many, many people who, who use the cross as a piece of jewelry. They'll tattoo it on their skin, but it means nothing to them at all. And that is what I want to press into this morning. What is the significance of the cross? Now, up to this point, if you read Matthew, you'll see that a mob of soldiers and Jews have kicked Jesus. They've punched him, they've mocked him, they've whipped him repeatedly. The flogging that Jesus endured meant that his hands would have been tied high to a pole so as to stretch his body out so the flesh would tear easily. Two soldiers would alternate strokes delivering the flagrum, or what was called the, the cat of nine tails. Several braided leather thongs pieced together with iron balls and sharp splinters of sheep bone knotted in various intervals. Their goal in those moments was to weaken the victim to just, a, to just short of death. An article that was written in 1986 in the Journal of, American, of the American Medical Association read this way. It said, as the Roman soldiers repeatedly struck the victim's back with full force, the iron balls would cut into the skin and subcutaneous tissue of the victim. Eventually, the lacerations of the whip would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock. Well, by this time, Jesus would have been barely able to stand up, covered in spit, profusely bleeding, barely clothed, and quivering in pain. Now, as we picked up the story, we see Jesus making his way to Golgotha. He would be carrying a crossbeam, which would have weighed about 200 pounds upon his back. It would have been placed on his back with a placard hung around his neck with the crime that he had committed, the one that he was accused of. The beam would have been used before, and so that meant that the smell and the gore of the previous victim would have been right there. It would have been rough hewn, so there would have been splinters and jagged edges piercing even further into Jesus' flesh. Paraded through Jerusalem, it would not have been uncommon for someone out of the crowd to, to jeer, but be even beyond that, they'd step in and maybe punch the man or, or spit upon him. It would not be unusual at all. 
as they headed toward crucifixion. Now, Matthew tells us that on this path, Jesus is so weak from the beatings that he eventually collapses to the ground. He's weak. Uh, and then a random man in the crowd is, is chosen by the guards to carry the cross. And we know his name. He is Simon of Cyrene. Verse 33 tells us, when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, uh, the Latin word for skull is calvaria, which, of course, is where we get our word calvary. Cavalry, or Calvary, I'm sorry. It was a hillside. I've, I've been to Jerusalem. Some of you in this room have been there. And, and, and there are speculations of where this place was, but, but I've been to a hillside that, that has that shape of a skull. It's amazing to think that Jesus may have died right there. But the Bible tells us that they gave him wine mixed with gall to drink. And when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. This would have been given as a narcotic, a painkiller, but Jesus refuses. I, I, I don't think it's because Jesus is against painkillers, not by any measure. I believe instead it was because Jesus intended to experience all the pain and shame of this moment. Jesus was demonstrating the depth of God's love for us, and he was determined to experience the full horrors of the wrath of God so that he might be able to deliver us. Then the Bible says they crucified him. That isn't all so bad when we get to the point. With spikes, they nail his hands to the tree, his feet to the cross. Now, you need to know crucifixion was designed expertly to keep the victim alive and in as much pain as possible for as long as possible. It involved, quote, dizziness, cramps, thirst, sleeplessness, hunger, traumatic fever, humiliation, shame, piercing wounds, ripped tendons. Hanging there, suspended by nails, he surely would have had his shoulders pop out of joint. He had to shift to, to try to breathe. In fact, the, the victim would, 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 would start to suffocate until he could gain enough strength to, to lift himself up. And so for six hours, Jesus alternates between searing pain and the panic feeling of suffocation. And all the while, I imagine, as he tries to lift himself up against that, that raw back, he, he's going against the, the center beam of that cross with, with the flesh that has been ripped open by the beatings and the whippings. You know, as I, I begin to think about that picture, I can't help but remember what Jesus had said when he said to his disciples the night before, this is... This bread represents my body broken for you. This cup, it is the cup of my blood, which was shed for the remission of your sins. When I look at that picture this morning, and I want you to see it, I, I want you to see it in your mind's eye. Friends, what we cannot do is walk away from this place and not realize that, that sin isn't serious. It's very serious. He was wounded for our transgressions, the Bible says. Our, our, our small acts of rebellion, our, our little lies, our refusal to let him be the center, our, 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 our opportunities that we take to, to seek the glory that belongs to him. He was bruised, the Bible says, for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we're healed. And so we know this morning that forgiveness is costly. Sin is serious. And in order for me to forgive you, I have to absorb the pain of that sin into myself. But God absorbs in Jesus all the pain, all the injustice of sin into himself in that moment. At the cross, 
God absorbs the sting of sin and the wrath of our transgressions. So the Bible says God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I want you to think about that place called Golgotha. Now, right before he died, Matthew tells us that Jesus utters two things from the cross. The Bible says about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is quoting from Psalm 22. As a holy God turns his back on the sin of the world, his son, who is his only begotten son, who has become sin, Jesus cries out. And then Jesus cries out with a loud voice, the Bible says, and Matthew says, he gave up his spirit. Luke gives us a, a, a picture here. Luke tells us what he said in that moment. Jesus said, Telestai, it is finished. It is finished. Verse 51, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. The curtain in the temple, the curtain is what separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the world. The curtain in the temple was about four inches thick. It, it was uh, woven of 72 blue, red, and purple cords. The curtain sealed off the people of God from the presence of God. It sealed off the holy of holies from the rest of us. And it was called the paraket, which literally means shut off. Because that's what it did. You couldn't go there upon pain of death. And yet that moment when Jesus died, suddenly this paraket is split in two. At that moment, something dramatic had changed. No more are we shut off from the presence of God because the price of sin had been paid. We can enter into God's presence through the torn body of Jesus. The presence of God is now open to all. And I can't help but think, when I think about what had happened, that song, lifted up, he was to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Now, not everyone saw Golgotha in the same way. And what I want you to discover this morning is that Matthew gives us four glimpses, four perspectives that I think in some ways as we examine this, that give us an avenue about how we can see Golgotha too. And how can we respond? First, I would have you remember here that Matthew points out that there were two criminals who joined in the raging against God. Matthew says that these two men were also hurling insults at him. Save yourself, save us too. Now, Luke tells us that one of the criminals eventually comes around and he repents, but at the beginning, Matthew is clear that they both are mocking him even as they stare at death in the face. These criminals then represent people, it seems to me, who are in pain cursing God for not delivering them. If you really are who you say you are, make this pain stop, God. Have you been there? Listen, when you are in pain, nothing makes you angrier than the idea of a God who could relieve that pain and doesn't. Nothing. And so I want you to see for a few moments here that every one of us has raged against God in a moment of pain and said, God, if you are, why don't you fix this? And then come the doubts. Maybe you aren't real. Maybe you aren't God. 
But Luke, again, says that one of them comes around and he says what is so very important. He says, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And friends, this is what we have to come to grips with this morning. We live in a sinful world. We have ourselves be, been sinners. We have sinned. We deserve our suffering. Jesus doesn't. We live in a world with pain because we live in a world condemned and haunted by sin, our sin. You see, in pain and suffering, it seems to me, we have two choices. One, you can conclude that your pain really means that Jesus is not who he says he is and he lacks the power to save you. You can come to that conclusion. Or two, you can look at the cross and you can say, wow, he really does care for me. The Son of God enters into the pain of this world. He comes alongside, he experiences the pain with me. And through the cross, he shows me that he loves me, and he gives me hope. The cross means he loves me, and he knows my pain. But I want you to notice something else here, too. Notice creation and its response. Creation itself begins to quake under the weight of this glory being displayed by God. In verse 45, we read, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. For three hours, it was nothing but darkness. Verse 51 says, An earthquake, and the rocks are split, come. It's as if in this moment, as creation views what is happening at the place called Gagatha, that creation itself begins to groan. Creation itself begins to grieve that the Creator is dying. Creation itself quakes at the glory of God that's being displayed at this place at Calvary. And, and so what, what, I, what I come to realize is I think that this is important to point out because it is a reminder that the cross always demands some kind of response. The cross demands a response from you. This morning, you know, you just can't look at the cross and pass casually by. This is not a historical curiosity. If this happened, the God who created everything, including you, bore your sin and died in your place. Friends, do you understand how insulting it would be for us to sit in this place and hear about these things and not be moved? To sing about them while we barely move our lips. To hold our cups of coffee with our hands in our pockets without truly worshiping in awe. These things demand a response from us. Something happened on Calvary that changes the world. And, and what is amazing to me, look at verse 52. This is, this is radical. Verse 52 says, And the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who died were raised to life. Now don't ask me to explain all this. But Jesus' death was so amazing that some of the dead couldn't control themselves. And they wake up and they walk out and they begin to dance and sing and celebrate. And I wonder, is anyone going to quake today? Is anyone going to get excited? Is anyone going to quake? You Quakers, remember, that's who we are. Is anyone going to worship today? Is anyone going to sing and celebrate and thank God for Calvary and what he did on the cross? Is anyone going to be moved today to say in this place, yes, to the gift of salvation that Jesus Christ offers? Because of what he did in this place. What are we going to do in this place? 
Because of what he did at the place called Gargotha, what is going to happen in this place this morning? But thirdly, I want you to notice this. Notice that there are outsiders who recognize who he is and that he is worth following. Verse 54 and 55 says, When the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Now think about that. Why is it that the only people who were around the cross that day that seemed to get it are those whom the Jews considered to be outsiders and second rate? Roman Gentile soldiers. Women. Now, let me just say something right there. Folks, the gospel never lets us think less of others. Do you hear that? Today, we just need to hear that. We need to, to recognize that it is impossible for a follower of Jesus to hold racist views. Impossible. We're all level at the foot of the cross. The religious people, they don't get it. The disciples, they're nowhere to be seen. The chief priests don't get it. But the Roman soldiers who begin to basically right here recite the Nicene Creed and these women who refuse to lead. And it's those same women who, by the way, would be testifying in three days to a, a resurrection why? And this is the truth. Because, listen, the cross can only be rightly seen from a perspective of humility. The cross can only be rightly seen from a perspective of humility. You see, only those who recognize their need for a Savior this morning are going to ever be in a place where they're going to receive him See, friends, if you come in this morning and you come here in your pride and really proud of who you are and what you've done, then you don't have any need. This isn't all that important. But listen this morning, if you're like me and you recognize that you need a Savior, this is a good place to be. But if you are rich, and, and, and let's take that in any way you want, rich in money or rich in power or rich in prestige, others think well of you. You grew up religious. You know all the answers. Beware. You might, in your mind, assent to certain truths about Jesus, but your soul really has never experienced what it is to need a Savior. You, you don't have a real personal relationship with Jesus. You just don't need him. You've never been gripped by that necessity of having him in your life. That's why Jesus said, listen, that's why Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Imagine that. Than for a rich person. Now, rich in money, rich in power, rich in religion, rich in religious tradition. You grew up, you know all the answers, however you want to put that, to enter the kingdom of heaven. So I ask you simply, do you need him today? Do you really need him today? Now, there's one more perspective here that I see at least. Uh, let's come back to Simon of Cyrene. We read this passage and we think this is a man called out to help Jesus carry Jesus' cross. I mean, that seems to be the story. Jesus collapses. He can't carry the cross any longer. So Simon is called out of the crowd and he picks it up and he takes it to Golgotha. 
But have you ever wondered why it is that we know Simon's name? That was interesting to me. That I, I, I mean, why does Matthew tell us it was Simon of Cyrene? Seems as if maybe people would perk up. They know that name. Why? In fact, if you read Mark, the gospel, we, know, we get to know even more. It says in, in the, the book of Mark, we're told that Simon is the father of Rufus. Well, why would Mark add that detail? Or is it that, that maybe along the way, as readers are reading this, sometimes decades later in the early church, wait a minute, I know Rufus. I know Simon. Simon's dad? Or, or Rufus's dad? In other words, there is a lot of evidence here that Simon and Rufus both became believers. That's why it's added. That's why it's part of the story. They became part of the church. And so as we read this, we begin to recognize something. So Simon helps Jesus. But if you spend enough time here in this place, you realize who was supposed to be on that cross? It wasn't Jesus. It was Simon. Who was supposed to be on that cross? It wasn't Jesus. It was Jeff. Who was supposed to be on that cross? It, it wasn't Jesus. It was you. Simon reminds us, he shows us that Jesus picks up our cross, not the other way around. The cross was ours, but Jesus takes it from us. And so when he died, when Jesus died, he took Simon's place. He, he took my place. He took your place. He was accused in your place, my friend. He was humiliated in your place. He was cursed for sin in your place, condemned in your place, defiled in your place, beaten, abandoned, and killed in your place. Salvation is the free gift to all those who say, Lord, I trust you. Thank you for taking my place. In fact, I, I think that's the gospel in four short words. Jesus in my place. Jesus in my place. Jesus, listen my friend, Jesus did not merely die for us. Jesus died instead of us. And when we truly put our trust in him, when we put our hope in him, when we decide to follow him, he gives us his life, and he takes our death. Jesus, in my place. That's what happened at a place called Godotha. Jesus took my place. Last week, I think Dave, Pastor David, shared with you that uh, Mary and I went down to visit with our children we had uh, wanted to see them at their schools. We went down to see Faith on Thursday at Cedarville University and then made the trek on Friday down to Asbury in Kentucky and Wilmore, Asbury University, to visit our sons Joshua and Micah. Uh, Joshua was a part, had a small part at the end of the play, uh, at a play on Friday night. I got to tell you, it wasn't a very good play. In fact, uh, it was rather difficult for me to have to sit through that, that two-hour event. I was so glad to finally see Joshua because it meant that the end of the play was nearly here. It was called uh, Take No Prisoners, and all the while I thought, take me, please, you know, uh, I'm, I'm ready. It was that bad, but uh, I, I could go on and on. But uh, after the play, after the play was over, both of my boys said, Dad, Mom, uh, you got to come with us to Wham. And I said, well, what's Wham? And he said, well, it's, it's worship at midnight. 
And I said, well, that sounds rather late to me. <laughs> but apparently, several times in a semester, uh, students will get together and worship on a late Friday night and just worship the Lord. And, and uh, I said, okay, it sounds like we can do that. And I walked into Hughes Auditorium. That's where they do their chapel. And, and I, wow, one thing that struck me is immediately when I walked in was just the energy of the room. It, we were there a little bit early, but boy, the students were already congregating. They were already gathering. And it's a, it's a small campus, about 1,200 students, but wouldn't you know it, there were about four, maybe 500 students in this place. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really interesting. And the other thing that caught my attention, I thought, I'm the oldest person in this room right now. It was just kind of, a, kind of sobering that way. But the, as they began to sing and celebrate and worship, read scripture and share testimonies, I tell you, my spirit just was buoyed. I, I, I just felt so encouraged and so blessed. And one of the testimonies was, was from a young man from Thailand who had been a Buddhist monk who had come to know Jesus. And he had come to Asbury, and he was a really good tennis player, and he shared some, some perspectives from tennis. And it was really interesting. Of course, it was about 12 o'clock, 12.30, going into, we started around 10.30, I think it was. And so it was, a, it was a good long time. But as I watched these students for two plus hours, praising God and giving testimony and reading the scriptures, I couldn't help but think about what students are known for all around the country on Friday nights and the difference. And the difference. And I asked myself, what, what is the difference? Why would, why would so many students come out and just worship God at 12, 1230 on a Friday night? And then it occurred to me. The difference is a place called Golgotha. The difference is the cross. And when you come to Golgotha, when you come to Calvary, when you come to recognize what happened at the cross, you change. Your life is different. It really is different. Because you recognize that Christ died in my place and I can now live for him. I'm his and he is mine. If you come to Golgotha, you recognize that Jesus did that for me. And so no matter what I've done and no matter where I've been, no matter how deep I've gone, just as I am, he invites me to a place called Golgotha to know that he took my place and that I'm free now when I put my trust in him to live for him forever. <laughs> 